Hiya everybody, uh, the 59 people, or 59 plus, who've uh, turned up on Zoom. Thank you all for being here, or being there, to make our summer school happen. Um, so I haven't done a Q&A lockdown style quite in this way before, but I have to say it's a real pleasure to be in the same physical space as Sean, and what a beautiful physical space it is. Thank you very much, Anthony Farrell of Lilliput Books for allowing us to use this amazing shop. I'd also like to thank the two Peters, Salisbury, like the Cathedral, for all the filming, and Peter McNamara for gatekeeping so brilliantly, and Declan Mead, the inimitable Declan Mead, for setting everything up and uh, revisioning the summer school so brilliantly. So hopefully this mashup between screen and real life will provide an extra layer where insights may happen for us all a canny, uncanny valley of the literary imagination, as it were. So before we start the Q&A proper, I want to say a few words to introduce Sean to those of you who mightn't be so familiar with his work. He was born in Derry in 1969, the author of two short story collections, Curfew and Other Stories and Levitation, and three novels, Love and Sleep, The Swing of Things, and again, Watermark. He's been writer in residence in many different contexts, including Dublin City Council and DR, DLR IADT. And for the last 12 years, including this year, he's run the Stinging Fly workshop. And I'm saying including this year because we're imagining okay. something will be going ahead. Mm. In addition, Sean has written numerous essays and has been a contributing editor to the Stingy Fly Journal, guest editing the 1916 Rising issue, among others. In 2018, he was elected to Aestona, a group of artists chosen by their peers. Adjectives that you'll see a lot if you Google Sean's work include perfect, profound, world-class, beautiful, radical, uncompromised, necessary, transgressive, brilliant, alienated and genuine. And these are words written by some of our finest writers and critics, including Anne Enright, Owen McNamee and the late Eileen Battersby. To all of them I say, hear, hear. Sean's prose sizzles with an intensity, a sad and savage authenticity that stays in the mind and blood long after reading. But Sean's writing practice isn't just about putting pen to paper or fingers to keyboard. He is also an acute listener a heartful, generous reader, a deep diving shaman who works magic on those he encounters. Anyone who sat around a workshop table discussing works in progress with Sean will know exactly what I mean. He has an ability to look beyond what he calls the cold words, the wordy surface of things, to plumb right into the writer's being and to help them divine what it is they may really be after and how they might go for it. I could go on at length, um, but <laughs> given the glitches, it's probably just as well. And also, really, what would be the fun of that? Boys, girls and others. Here's Sean O'Reilly. Let's have a chat, Sean. All right, let's go for it. OK, so the first thing I want to ask is about um, writing. So I know that your practice is integrated, it's layered, and there's these different layers in it. But in terms of the actual putting words together and making things out of them, when, when, if at all, did you first begin to think of yourself as a writer or that that was what you do? I'm, it's, I, I'm not that comfortable with the word writer, to be honest. Um, James Kelman, the Scottish writer, said to me once, um, are you a writer or are you an artist? Hmm. And I think I'm still trying to answer that, that question. I move from what one to the other, but I, I think of it more like more of it as a continuous verb mm -hmm. that you're writing, mm -hmm. that you you're doing something, you're trying to make something. You know, a writer, it's like a dead, it's a dead stuck word or something. It's like, are you writing? Why are you writing? I'm writing. Uh -huh. It's something that I feel and what more do you comfortable feel, with. What you feel is so. What you feel is gives the the word writer that stuckness and that deadness. Um, I think a lot of very um old notions about what a writer is, per, uh -huh. perhaps, um, vague r romantic notions of the solitary and the attic with a quill and stuff like that. You know, um, the author is you know dead and buried. But, and for me, I mean, like to go to try and answer your question, where where you might get it from, when I th when I think back, what you know, to getting going, what I always saw writing as was um, 
was a type of collaboration mm -hmm. anyway. Um, it was Dadaism and Surrealism. It was reading about the antics of the Surrealists and stuff that first got got me excited. And, and where did you find them? And well, I would have I would have first got that through music, through listening to music and trying to find out about like who who, who Jim Morrison was, who who Morrissey was, who Lloyd Cole was. You know. Um, going to the local library and o ordering books and stuff like that um, when I realized you could do that um, you know th that there, you know where I grew up as well there was there was a sense where you could, the, the whatever you were doing had to be part of some type of struggle towards something mm -hmm. you know it was a it was a difficult um, terrain difficult environment so the idea that you could be remote, from that, um, that didn't didn't occur to you. Yeah, something that strikes me when you're talking about writer and you're talking about it as a stuck or a dead concept, that idea of it being like being removed, being in the ivory tower, and being an action solely of the mind or the intellect. Uh, would I be right in kind of uh, guessing that there's something about that that you resist? That idea that it is only in the mind. Yes, de definitely. I mean, like like yourself i did you know a bit of theory did a lot more but um you, you know the the body and how you how you're living even um becomes part of how you work what ideas you might decide to take seriously enough that you want to explore develop them in in, in some way um i think there's something about even that word that you used there, uh, the shamanistic, that I, I think a, is useful for developing different ways to get around um, reason, let's call it, mm -hmm. to get around rationality, which I don't think can actually take us that far if we are to talk about writing. Mm -hmm. And where 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 it's coming from, or who's doing the writing, or why you're doing the writing, and all that. I think we very quickly end up in the world of metaphor, mm -hmm. um, an illusion, and um, mystery. Yeah. I mean, there's there's a thing I you have to yeah you have to realize that when you're when you're teaching, or when you go through the universities or whatever is that you know when creative writing is 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 developed in the universities that that means they're developing it as something that is measurable quantifiable skills based transferable from one one to the other and markable and markable yeah that means you got to break it down they've got to did they do this did they do that did they you know and you, you give them you give them a grade yeah you know and so that that means the the strangeness and mystery of it is broken down right now that's that, that could be thought of as a, a sacrifice. That could be thought of as um, a liberation. I mean, in a sense that you, you do sacrifice mystery when you're talking about writing, you know, I feel. But yet, if we don't talk about it, we and break it down, we allow basically a permanent elite to, to keep a hold of it. And then we can't actually approach it in any way through the education system, which is where it's got to, it's got to be addressed. So, so it's the difference, though. There's a difference, I think, between literary theory, which is the kind of practice of, I suppose I'm thinking of Eliot, I'm thinking of all that branch of talking about words um, in a cano canonical kind of way. Uh, there's a value. There's often a value judgment about what is best writing and what is not best writing, but to me it seems that there's a difference between that kind of literary theory and engaging as you and I and other facilitators do in a workshop situation with works that are emerging. Yes. What is that? So what is that difference? If you um, if you agree with me, yeah. Um, I think yeah, there is a big difference in what happens in a in a writing workshop 
um, the reading that goes on, the type of reading that goes on, it's, it's very different to the type of reading that you might be using w with a finished text, you know, with a published book, with a cover on it and all that. It's sealed, it's done, it's finished. Nothing you're going to say about it or think about it is going to make a blind bit of difference, all right? But in a workshop, the material is more, is more improvisational, you know, and you're, you're, you're trying to find out what it might be wanting to be. No matter, it may be pretending to be something. It may be disguised. It may be, um, or it, sometimes it comes out nice, nicely formed. But y your, your approach to it is sometimes to look what is behind the surface of it. Um, into the into the long grass of it, there might be just some a minor character that's mentioned that might be where it is actually all of, all about. And in a sense, the act you talk about in your essay um, that the, the the workshop in a way becomes what the people who want to pay for the workshop want it to become. So the fact that somebody is presenting work that they're signing up for a workshop they're they're agree they agree that you they want the long grass looked at they're, they're not looking it's the difference between somebody wanting praise and somebody wanting feedback yes so you so going back to this idea of the literary literary theory which is around an analysis of exi existing finished texts which cannot be changed essentially and workshop analysis for want of a better word or workshop discussion which is um it feels much more um, like there's something much more mutable. The work itself is mutable, but also ideas about the work can be more mutable, can be changed in the encounter. I think, you know, th th there's, there's different, there's a number of different ways you can, you, you can approach it. And, you know, when you're, when you're going in there on, on a Monday night, you're, you're often not sure what way you're going to approach it. You've thought about it, you've read it, and you often don't know until maybe somebody in the group says someone else, which takes you one way or, t or, or, t or takes you another way. I, 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 don't, I don't go in with a clear um, idea of what, what, what I'm going to say. I, I, I feel that would run counter to the spirit of it. Uh, because the person then presenting that work or whatever, it, 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 it's live. It, it, it is happening there and they're, they're taking an enormous risk to do it but I, I do I do take take some things in with me and, and that is stuff around like say if, if dreams have taught us anything is that everything comes in disguise like nothing nothing just jumps out and goes this is what I mean this is what it is nothing is self-identical there, there is ambiguity in it and everything so you may be just going in and going, what might be underneath that, all right? But what you might be looking for, if it's a short story in particular, you're looking to go, where is the little desire machine, you know? Where is the little spark that in that character sets them in motion? So by desire machine, t tell me a little bit more about what, is that desire machine in the text itself? Is it in the, in the writer? Is it bo both? It, it can be in both and it can be some, somewhere in between and you, you might only see it when you're talking about it, you know, when somebody else says something else or it may, it may just appear, you may get a glimpse of something. Um, it, it, it is about watching uh, and listening to, to the words that are, that are going around. You are, you are on time, you are on the clock in a mm. sense, so you can only do what you can do within that, that period of time. Um, so you, you sometimes have got to go, well, let, let's try and push that way because we've got to push some way. Yeah. You know, we can't, we can't sit back and say, oh, well, um, <laughs> that's good. You know, um, like the, the courses were, were, you know, never about, you know, patting people on the head for self-expression. The courses are, the, you know, the, the courses are, are about creating maybe an object of the work. And I think it's that transition. Something happens when the work moves from the personal, the private, the interior into the public. What, that, that passage 
That transition is um, extraordinary. It's something that I often notice in a workshop is, is particularly when the group has met for several times so they've got over kind of um, the initial strangeness and there's a lot more trust between them. There's more trust in the room. But when people start talking about a character, the character becomes... Um, oh, I'm getting feedback. Um, the, but, the, but it's almost like the character enters the space and we stop talking about the character as something that's in the writer's mind. The character is actually invited into the room and they start inhabiting different corners of the room. I, 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 I love it when that happens, y yes. And um, alongside character, you know, uh, there can be just an image yeah. or something that, that, that happens in the room. Um, or it can be a bit of description, or, or there can be a little bit of dialogue, um, where you know where, where the where the the forces and the energies in in the draft, because that's what we're talking about, might just collide for a moment, and you can see that that might be the thing that the the writer is trying trying to get at. I part of the part of what you're trying to uh, help people do is not try and push the the energies that they're trying to unleash into a preconceived form mm -hmm. all right which of course is what you know what people will, will tend will tend to do and you know that that the characters do not have to sit face to face in a room like talking like, like this for meaning to occur that meaning is maybe more than dialogic you know, meaning happens in many, many different ways, and that um, but but that for for a story to proceed, there is generally some some type of pursuit of desire. Mm. You know, somebody is looking for something. There is a predicament. If they want out of that predicament, they want to deepen that predicament. There is a predicament, right, and. You, you have to keep following the desire till you reach a point where um, the desire has, um, encounters maybe the desire of another. And from that, you might then get some collision, which might then help you get some type of ending because we, you have to get to the end, <laughs> yeah, you know? Yeah. That, that's, that's the key thing. You know, we've got to get to the end of this story. So how do you, I mean, I've always been really impressed by the quality of listening you bring to the room. Like, remember the first time I witnessed it, you'd asked me to come in and talk to a group and you just asked maybe one or two really, I think it was one question actually. And I just felt, I actually felt in myself, boom, you were hitting off something. It's like, okay, I can talk. Oh, I'm going to be talking about this. This is interesting. Um, how do you how do, how so you are you are waiting you're you're watching you're listening what are the cues that you get in your own body that alert you to mm, yes yes i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to see if i can bring the conversation around here all right again there's um a lot of different um things or, or techniques that, uh, that I might use and only the moment will will decide that. Um, while um, while you're listening, there's different places you, you, you can go to where maybe you're not just listening for sense. You might be listening for a word that strikes you and then you might start free associating mm -hmm. ar around, around that word, around, around the, con the conversation looking for other ways in beyond the rationalized discourse mm. that is that is very very artificial uh, anyway you know oh, i i like what your character is do, doing here you know that i believe in your character you know, that you, you, your character might be described as um tall right i was I, one what, what tall i might just go round round that and i might just even spell tall out in my head, T A L double. There's a double L. I might go. I might go off into doubleness or any anything at all to try and shake up 
the predictability of, of the conversation that they might predict that they're going to have. Yeah. You know, and they yeah, yeah. will be be prepared for yeah. as well. And and that the a lot of the, the drafts you're dealing with, um, the writer is prepared to talk about them in a certain way. <laughs> right? And so they're they're attached to them. And so you somehow you've got to free them for, from the text to objectify the text that is a separate object independent of you in a way you know let's let's turn it around and move it around a, a bit i mean we're like see like we're talking about close reading right um i mean the close reading of a draft is different than the close reading of the finished pub published text of, of course but the, again there's a lot of ways into it like first of all, I don't I don't think there's any point reading anything that is not turning you on. It's not got mm. you excited. Mm. So don't be bothering close reading something that is, is dead air to you, right? So when when you when you encounter something that is voltage that gets you going, yeah, you you put it aside and you go woohoo, right? But isn't there isn't there an argument that if say a challenge and i would set this challenge with people so if there's a challenge to find something that turns you on even if it's like even if it's one word can't that be can't that shake you up as a reader as well it's like okay if the challenge is i'm close reading something and i've got to find that one thing in the whole thing it might have thousands and thousands of words but is there one thing that turns me on if, is there one thing that i can go ah oh, yes uh, d definitely and uh, uh, that's what, what i mean too is, is um th there's a whole range of different types of close reading is what, what i mean uh -huh. you know you're there there's your your text and one of the first things I will do to to try and shake up my own reading is again it's free associate through it all right so you just go through it and pick out words words or phrases that hit you do it why they hit you who knows all right and you list you list them down you see you see you see where they go and that's that's one reading you know then, then you might you might go in and you know and you might pick one image and see if it's repeated all right see if you can find any repetition and you go off of that are you going and you look at the, the character, you know, character without dialogue, take out all, all dialogue, but break it up and turn, turn it around. I mean, again, it goes back to that thing about, like, we're talking about mystery and letting the mystery lie or break, breaking it down. See, I was actually, over the weekend, ask, asking a couple of writers w w what they do. And a couple of them said, oh, God, no, if I really like it, I just, leave, you know, leave it as it is. I do not want to break the mystery. <laughs> Is this work there of their own? No, no, oh, no. Oh, somebody else. Yeah, they go, oh, yeah, God, yeah. no, it's just yeah. brilliant. It's just, yeah, yeah. And they do yeah. not want to break down. Uh -huh. And, you know, maybe they they are breaking it down anyway, quietly, but they, they wouldn't go through the process yeah. of, you know, nailing it to the wall and, ch and chopping it up and, t and t turning it round. Yeah, there is you know? a risk. Like, I remember I did uh, communications in college and one of the texts we studied was how to read a film. And for... A year. 12 angry men was it oh, no it was just it was whatever applying kind of visual storytelling anal analytical tools to looking at movies right. so for a year after leaving college i couldn't watch a film without looking at the craft that went into right. it right. and i was like oh films are ruined and then it sort of went it it, uh, it trickled down right. and now it's there right. but it certainly doesn't ruin but uh, that i think that's really interesting it's almost like um what what is that person afraid of losing by by starting to break down the piece by starting to unpack it open up the engine what are they afraid yeah. Yeah. and in my experience if i do and i was really anxious because the two pieces i'm close reading this week i was really anxious that i'd ruin them for You're myself yeah. but it's like i i know i actually i've read them twice now i'll be reading them again and in fact no it's it's just a different type of attention what I, I, you, you may actually end up back at the mystery anyway after you've yeah, it all going like I there are no all the idea. components yeah. you stick them together but I, I still can't get at the mystery yeah. what one one of the things just to to be about that is to is to free yourself to read to misread to read badly to yeah. to read lots to, to, to read anarchically yeah. you know to read shamanistically to you know, to, to try and go i am not ever going to try and defend my reading as an objective 
analysis of, of, of this this piece of work. I don't know, don't know about you, but when you publish something anyway, like you're, you're it's a go. <laughs> you're just, you're just trying to try and defend it. It's a, mm. against all the possible readings that are going to go on. It's, it's a bit, it's a bit pointless. And it's also joy. I mean, it's a that's the the joyful. It's frightening, but like there's no real joy without fear uh, an element of it it's like throwing something out into the world how people how people misread or or reread or underread or overread or whatever the work is is part of the joy of having it out there like when somebody gives me an explanation for a text i've written i think it's marvelous it's like wow that's for you what it's about that's fantastic maybe it is about that mm. yeah how, how do i know yeah uh, there's a point where i don't know yeah i i'd like to ask you about where we've both we've spoken here we've spoken before about um i suppose the pedagogy of facilitating anchoring mentoring whatever the right word is um what goes under creative writing teaching where did you where did your ideas get honed like where did your ideas around how to manage a group and how to if that's the word and or how to facilitate that process or those processes where did those come from where did you have those learn them yeah, again i think we, we face the same question around pedagogy as we do around the text itself you know the breaking it down the mystery of, of of the teaching even yeah. we're, 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 we're doing the same thing we have to do the same thing <laughs> but you know i i went into it just with the one word honesty you know to try you with, with declan at the at the beginning we were just trying to go we're just going to create groups right and bring people in and give them as much honesty as you can about about, about the work so that you know because then they might be going to university to try and do it and, and all that but to actually just try and give back some type of honesty right there was no no more than that um that has of course grown and developed um over the years you know it's quite naive to think that you can just be honest mm. that somehow that people are even ready for for that or that they even want honesty you know there's a whole load of, load of different approaches and each group is different and, oh, oh i'm different each time i do it all, all all that sort of stuff um but um i think i i learned a lot I, um, when I trained to be a teacher, um, that was in London. I trained in further education, mm -hmm. um, and we we were allowed to call. And I never knew that about you. Right, no, right. there you go. Yeah, we were allowed to call ourselves teachers. We were called um, managers of learning, right? <laughs> and this was a radical. This was a radical course, right? And it was going. To, it was aimed at those who might want to teach in third level because uh, they were going to introduce a qualification for university lectures they didn't do it in the end all right but um what what that what that meant was that we were we were looking at how that whatever subject you were doing you had to break it down into units that you could verify that you had passed on to the students why because that liberated the students you had to decenter the teacher from the room there was to be, you know, groups had to, that teach had to be done in groups. There was no looking at, at a teacher at the front of the room or a lecture. It was group work all, all the way. But it meant that by the end of that course, I could go into an engineering crowd and cover for that engineering because it had been laid out in units. I would give it, assess it, blah, 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 right? That procedure has gone, has gone into bloody everything right the breaking down into units verifiable I mean, it comes from management right that in management discourse is, there's been a revolution in this country of management, management discourse overtaking everything productivity all that kind of that, that kind of stuff right and as artists we are you know forced to deal with that and for, forced to fight against it what is it to be productive mm. what is this piece of work that is being presented to you you know, is it is it a production? Uh, I I refuse to see it as a production, particularly at an at an early stage. The pedagogy develops then around um, 
developing my sense of what a draft is mm. and where where it's coming from in, in each different person you know you're getting 10 people around the table and those people are changing their life routine to to be there apart from the fact they're paying money but they're going you know if they've got kids or whatever they're going you got to do that. you got to reorganize a lot of stuff there's people coming from different bits of the country mm. you know on filthy winter nights you know and trains and buses and all that cars to get there and so what 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 is, what is it then when they are presenting the their draft you know what where is that draft from in them, you know? And I've got to try and get them to separate from that draft and spread that draft around into everyone so that they everyone consumes it and gets it inside their, inside their body, you know? Um, so that they can feel it and they can feel what, what it might be, mm. what it might be trying to... Mm become to mm. become and to what extent is your role to triangulate uh, so there's a group of 10 people and they've absorbed this work they're they're processing it they're and then they are they're responding or they're responding and processing or whatever whatever order it comes from so to what extent do you see your role as being to mediate and triangulate all that response uh yeah it's it's hard um, to 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 find the words for what what your rule is. Um, the, the rule changes. Um, the seasons have a big part part in huh. that. You know, we go from September through to March April. You know, we go down into the depths and we co we come out the other side. Now you you can guarantee that there's certain points in in that that journey where everyone is low. People, you know, you hit December, pe people have no energy, mm. you know, it's a dark night. So you got to go in, you got to try and jazz it up, you know, um, but you got to go in and there's someone who's furious at you because someone you said last week or other. And how you, how you go at that um, is to focus on the draft. Yeah. That's just, Give me, give me, give me all that you're gonna you're gonna throw at me, but all we've got here is that draft, that character, this this location, you know. Well, which strikes me as a really good way of setting up for writers, for people who write, who are going to continue writing all their lives, that they begin to think of the highest good of the work rather than the highest good of their ego which might be in complete contradiction to that so that 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 it's the the point is to bring the work as far as possible and to keep bringing it like i often think god i could probably spend the rest of my life writing one piece of work and it, that wouldn't be a bad thing in terms of the work um but it doesn't really work in this society but um but it's it's really heartening so that idea that you are getting them th to think of the draft that it's outside them that it is they use themselves to uh, in attention against it or with yeah. it yeah 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 i mean it, it it's you gr a group can can really help you um get round yourself you know um one, one of the biggest obstacles you face in the first couple of weeks of the group is vanity you know um there's an enormous am amount of vanity around writing and why people think that they want to write and you have to try and get just get get rid of that I mean, you, you, you know i you're talking about pedagogy that i would also also read into you know uh, the history of writing groups you know like you you, you think of um philip hobsbawm for, for example who came he came out of he came out of Cambridge, set up a group in Cambridge, went to Belfast in the 60s, set up the writing group there, out of which Heaney, Mahan, etc. all came. Then, then went to Glasgow and set up another group there, out of which James Kellman and uh, loads of other people c came as well. You, 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 go, to, you go to the, the States, right? And you got, you got the, 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 new, the new narrative crowd of the 1970s, which is very re relevant now. The, the, the procedures they tried to use to write, you know, um, 
kind of keeping the eye more local, bringing in politics, mm -hmm. kids, all, all that, um, trying to um, come up with something different than uh, objective and language based approach at the time. You know, all the, there's an enormous amount of work that has come out of of, of groups. You know, and um, that that people may may only get that courage um, in in the group setting. Yeah. You yeah. know, courage, bravery. Yeah. To yeah. actually try and say that thing or to to risk revealing the thing that wants revealed yes. and, and what that might do to you. Yeah. You know, yeah. you might turn around and go, This is not my beautiful life. This is <laughs> you know, this is not my yeah. beautiful car. Things might happen to you yeah. on account of what you're doing. Yeah. The, the that's the unpredictable yeah. quality of all, all this, you know? I'm going to take this moment, I think, to maybe take some questions if there are any. Okay. <laughs> if they're not, it's fine. Like we, we'll, we'll, um, well, we'll take a moment anyway. Um, oh, blue hand. Is there a blue? Um, does anyone have any questions at this point? And can you hear me? And thanks so much for bearing with us. Hello. That's mine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or are we? Could could we just unmute everybody for a moment and then? See, I don't it know, should be fun. Like we'll be doing to you tomorrow. That that would be <laughs> the, the, the right way to do this. I mean, might get around to saying what. Yeah. You want to say? That was really okay. Nice well, what saying about I think we'll go, go the, back. The Unless structured I'm learning. No, I'm not. Okay, we'll just carry on. We're just kind of great. Okay. Um. Are people really there? <laughs> yeah, I know. Well. Showing How many times a day do you ask yeah. yourself that question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, both feet on the ground. Um, Am I really here? What? So where? Okay. So what I loved about that essay, though, well, there were many things that really resonated with me, but but it seemed to me it was both um, like a, a a kind of song of celebration around about the table. Um, but it was also um, an elegy or a peon for something that, that might actually be lost. So have you been, since you wrote the essay, wh where's your thinking now about the table, where it might go, what might happen to it? I'm desperately worried um, about the table um, and about people being, being together. Um, I think there's... I, I think as a society, <laughs> we're, we're in terrible danger of losing social space. Something that, you know, we fought to, we fought to have, you know, our rights to do stuff, you know, on the streets. Mm -hmm. um, we've been assailed with, you know, surveillance for the last few decades, been recorded, every, everything we do. And now, now we're, we're threatened with it going right immediately you step outside that front door you're you're going to be masked your your inter interaction with, with with people is is full of caution i mean it's a, it's, a, it's a nightmare mm -hmm. you know and i i'd be i'd be very concerned about what will be lost i mean expediency cannot be the only aesthetic for for how we carry on you know i mm -hmm. i i i think uh, yeah, we're gonna to have to fight back. To, to be honest, you know. Naomi Klein had a great piece she today indeed, about yeah. touch, and she was. She's talking been writing about. She's yeah. been writing about who who yeah. benefits from all this. Stuff, yeah. You know. But this idea of touch, touch, like like, and why shouldn't things take longer? It was something I'd been thinking about about school, like the the formal education system. Well, if you need, if you can't squash the same amount of kids, say, into the same amount of hours. Well, for a start, teenagers shouldn't be shouldn't be 
to going to school before midday anyway, anyway because yeah. their cortexes are still growing so yeah. they should be lying in bed but also like why not create more jobs like that's a green new deal where you create more jobs for teachers or i i was even thinking about our our summer workshop like what if you have maybe smaller groups but not tiny groups so you have smaller groups you extend it out over a longer period you have more facilitators so there's actually more opportunity for people to share there's but but that but also outdoors you know like the outdoor space is is really it's probably the safest space weirdly these days and like why not why not kids learn like i learned so much as as a kid going for walks with my dad in the forest like why not learning bring why why write why do we have to be indoors as writers like why do when our when our lived life outside is often what creates the material that goes into the work well i think all those ideas should be should be in the mix uh we can't allow just an either or situation you know where oh no we're all we're all on zoom or what, what, whatever else that, that we're using and, this and the that exhausting, we're all removed yeah there's that exhausting quality like one of the things about the workshop is it's exhausting but it's exhausting like going for a great run like i'm you know i'm knackered at the end of the day but i feel like i've really my whole body has been engaged Whereas when after Zoom, I can be, I'm exhausted, but it's, it feels very like front brain kind of exhaustion. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's not great for nuance, you know, it's not, not great for just following something kind of round the back, you know, if you've... What kind of nuance? Well, kind of shy person down, down in a group or something, you know, you have to try and bring, bring them in. If, if you're... I yeah, that could take weeks of work to try and try and prepare the ground to bring to bring people in, you know, who might be very very reluctant. Um, I I I think it it can help people hide, you mm -hmm. know, so that even when they when they they do a course or whatever, they're they're both hiding, and and not hiding, at the same time they're not fully in there physically. Are we? We've got a couple of questions. Oh, I'll great! Fantastic! Quick. Brilliant! So, uh, I'll try this. Uh, hello. I, I, I missed the very begin the beginning of that. We have to go again. Is that Graham? Yeah, it's Graham. I I recognise your voice. So just. Um, so the, the question was around. Could you talk a little bit more about? You said um, you should free yourself to misread. Um, what what that might mean? How you know what what that might mean? Yeah. Right. Um. It's a you know, go go into text and um accepting first of all that your reading of it is completely anarchic and it, it is that it is not something you can even explain to yourself that your what, what is going on with your relationships with all the words and everything else is actually not in your consciousness so that you you've got to try and um capture something in movement the arrow in flight or whatever a little glimpse of something that has caught um, your interest. You know, see, you're, you're, you're reading a sentence and, you know, there's what one word or even a couple of letters, there's E and A stuck together. That's just caught your interest. And you, you don't, do not know why. And you try and just follow that scent um, through a kind of mad kind of movement dance through the, through the material switching round genders firing you know cutting it up you know reading sentences twice um you know running the paragraphs together writing out some of anything at all to disrupt your learned um mode of reading 
and and to free yourself to, to and to realize that when people are reading they only think they know what it is that they're doing and there's very little of it you can actually justify i mean we, we think oh prose short story it's different than reading reading a poem i really don't think that at, at all the same freedom you would allow yourself when you read a poem you should be given to the, 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 sh the short story and you know some interest in novels as well will, will extend that but th there is there is ambiguity in every in every word and a personal subjectivity to the response to the word that you are you, even blind to so it's just to be free with it and to try and, and to try and remind yourself that you when you're writing can be aiming at a reader's subconscious as much as you're aiming at their so-called precious rational mind i think we have another question Yeah, um, I know, I know, I know the Nick Cohen stuff. All right, um, that's, that's, that's brilliant, crazy stuff. I uh, really enjoyed that, um, but that wouldn't have been something that um, I, I would have known about. Um, early mentors and all that, you know, there's no books in our house, sort of thing. Um, no, no teachers um, left, ran away. Um, it, for, for me, one of the most life-changing things for me was um, encountering um, the work of James Kelman. I, I can't say that enough. I say that to everyone. James Kelman um, brought together, for me, everything that I would found interesting or uh, exciting uh, about European modernism and found it then a way to talk about um, working-class characters in, in Glasgow. And he brought... He solved the big problem for me, how to bring those two things together, um, particularly in A Disaffection. That, that book just uh, was the most exciting thing that has ever happened to me, by far. And um, he has continued to um, pursue that, that line. So it, you know, my mentors would have been finding books really um angela carter as well um infernal desire machines of dr hoffman completely turned me turned me around one of the first books i tried to close read by chopping up and all that yeah james kelman angela carter put them together so we have a question from tom Tommy Morris. Hey, right, Tommy. Um, you, I'm curious now, you talking, you know, we're talking about reading and about the reader. Um, it makes me wonder in what way do you think about the reader in your own fiction when what? you're writing? Do you have a reader in mind? Do you have a constant reader? Given that you think that <laughs> there's no correct reading, let's say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think, again, as a, an artist, use that word, well, one, one of the things you um, will be doing is, is thinking about your viewer, your relationship uh, with your viewer, all right? Um, funnily enough, um, I was reading... Um, There's the reader. There's <laughs> <laughs> the reader. Uh, Hang it up, go on, hang it up. <laughs> oh. 
Pick up the phone, put it down. Yeah, I don't know where it is. Right. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um I I, I think I think writers um have a have a a much, a much more needy relationship with um their audience than say um visual artists would. Yeah, you know, visual artists be free to go. No, I want to make them think about this or that, or um, I want, I, you know, I want to make them uncomfortable. I want to do this or that. Yeah, writers are often talking about want, wanting to make make these make these connections. I, I was reading Maggie Nelson's um, "The Art of Cruelty" there um, recently about this. You know, about, about using um, cruelty on on your audience. And in different different art forms, of course. And I, I think there's a bit of scope in there for um, for us writers um, to be actually asking more of the reader, what is it you're doing here? What 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 do you want? You know, yeah. where, who are you? Where, where do you think that comes from? Like, where do you think in the tradition for want of a word does that um caution about the reader <laughs> come from i'd say it comes out of the liberal arts e e education where like the you know, literature is being taught as a almost contemplative reflective um morally improving um practice you know i i've i've read I've read Jane Austen. I am morally improved by the the acts of reason that, that, that are going on in that. That we we reflect back on things that have happened, and we use our our great breadth of moral vision and compassion to, to think about the, these things. And and is it linked to the canon and the idea that this is that you you study certain certain writers for the leaving cert say for the junior cert for in college that these are the, these are the writers that we go to because they are better so there's an idea that there's almost like one you know the the say the education system down here anyway it's like it's not there isn't room to to disagree mm. Mm. to say well actually i really liked that salome story by porig o'connor but i hated your one now yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I, again, like, again, with, with poetry, again, there's a bit more freedom about the relationship between the poet and, and, their, and their audience and the reader. And sometimes the prose writers can just get get, get stuck in it. I, I, I want you, I want to make you feel and agree with me and that we all need to agree. Or even non-fiction, and I'm sure, um, you know, like the non-fiction strand are, are, are covering that, that, that's, that there has to be, that an essay has to have a particular shape. It's got to make an argument. Yeah. What, if, what if the essay is just incapable of making an argument at that time and place? You know, why? Would not be brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Why, why does there have to be an argument? Why does logic have to behave in a certain way? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like logic comes from logos, which is truth, but truth is so do, 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 can be anything. Yeah, you know, to go to back to Tom's question there, I mean, all you can do really is go, what what would I like to read? What you know, what what, what do you want to read? How do you want a writer to treat you as, as a reader? Yeah, you know, do you want do you want to read a writer who wants you to agree with them, mm. or, do, or do you want to be re, read a writer that's trying to spin you around, ask you questions, go, what are you doing? Read it. What, what, what is this thing you're doing? So just, yeah, just to push a, a, a bit about this, what is going on in the, the dialogue. We have another question. Lisa, I think, is it coming up? Or... Hello? Yes. Yeah, um, yeah, Sean, I just wanted to ask you how you feel about creative writing masters. For those of us who don't have much of an academic background in writing, um, because I know there's a lot of discussion about that at the moment, and I'm into writing better, so I'd be curious to hear what you think. Well, firstly, we set up the six months 
Sling and Fly group um, to give people um, the best of a master's, which is the workshop. All the rest is just you know, fluff added on. English. And you know, to try and qualify you for the master's thing. And the university's got to do that. But the heart of it is workshop. That's where it all is. And uh, if you find a good workshop, it doesn't have to be at university. You may want your qualification, although what you're going to do with an MA in creative writing, <laughs> really, I don't know, what? Lots of things. Lots of things, <laughs> yeah. The work, finding, finding the workshop environment is, is the main thing. If you think you will benefit from that, if you're ready to get stuck into that group of people, then yeah, go and do it wherever, wherever you can find it, you know? But, you know, uh, we get a lot of people both going to an MA and after MAs and there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of dissatisfaction and, you know, you might not, you might, you know, you might want to look around at all the different places now that offer them and find out who is leading them, find out what type of writing that they do. Find out what you know, what they're about. Don't just wander into some institution without looking into who is in that place. Isn't there also the thing of like not be too hung up on being accepted? You know, like there's a ah. like the value judgment. You know, it's it's your it's your call. It's your time. Your time is precious. So you need to do the thing. Find the thing that's right for you. Not not be too anxious to be approved or accepted by some establishment. I mean, it's your practice, it's your words, it's essentially, it's your life. So how, you, how you're gonna to choose to spend that time, whether it's six months or two years, completely your call. You need to, you need to suit yourself here. Yeah, yeah. I think universities should give more tasters. It should be, they should be trying to get people in by, you know, offering free, you know, workshops to, be, to begin with, to give people an idea of what it is that, 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 they're, going to, that they're going to go through, you know? And um, so just, you know, look, just look around. Don't, don't rush into um, some university because you think you're going to get the best thing there. That may not be the case. You might find uh, a better group uh, in your local library. Um, do we have any more questions there from people or comments? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we, we have people with PhDs on the Sting and Fly course and, um, you know, yeah, people with MAs and, and you wonder what, like, often what, what, they, were, what they were doing, you know. Um, don't be thinking that this is, an MA is, um, is really like a, like a route, a route into publishing. Um, it is like you're saying it is it is going to be about the writer behind that 
And if the drive is strong enough, you'll find you'll find the way. I think and you'll find a way. And it's interesting as well. I did um, a day long workshop in Belfast about two years ago and I presented we were, it was on editing, but I presented a couple of texts and one of them would be seen as formerly very adventurous, Mike McCormick's um, yeah. Solar Bones. Yeah. And then there was another text which was, you know, m much more uh, like the punctuation, the way it looked on the page looked like much more what you think a book looks like. And it was the people who had had no further education, whose education finished at secondary school, well, I asked, I just did a test saying like, how many of you, wh which one do you find easier? Basically at a glance, everybody who had gone beyond secondary school education or A-levels or whatever went, oh, they found um, Mike's piece harder to look at. Everybody who hadn't gone beyond That's further it. education found yeah. Mike's piece easier to read. So it's like it can get in the way, yeah. you know, and education can be a bad thing sometimes. Yeah, right, yeah. And again, yeah, other life experience, you know, what other things you're interested in, music, you know, painting, all, all the things can, can provide you with uh, those little nudges and those instinct, instinctual moves when you're, when, you're making, when you're making sentences, when you're making paragraphs. You just take that wee step and you have, you're not going to take that step because you've done, I've done an M.A not going to give you it. Yeah, well, um, hello, Lisa. Um, don't forget that there are books as well that, that can be read. Um, and there is a whole world um, online as well. There's, there's YouTube stuff. There's a whole lot of people that can talk to you about things without you having to necessarily, you know, go and tie yourself uh, into a year at... UCD or, or wherever you know so um, what what you might think you're missing might be your liberation Lisa you know <laughs> we all think we're missing stuff the lack we lack this we lack that but you have to live you live and work with that you know uh, if you pick up a paintbrush and try and do something on a canvas without you know knowing anything at all you're doing. You know you can you can still produce something that way, and learn as you go. The most important thing is to put yourself into it completely. Um, I, can people hear me or <laughs> how does this work? Anymore, Peter? Okay. No, I'm just wondering because maybe tying in with uh, what Lisa is talking about there and what Jim is talking about a bit and what Sean's answers are. But, um, you know, like one of the things that I know Sean kind of encounters with bringing a group is, is getting people to kind of, you know, tell their story and for people to face up to their, their story that they want, that they really want to tell or really can tell. That is, that is their story uniquely um, and a lot of the workshop can be spent kind of getting people to kind of confront that story or to take it on um, what would you say to that Sean I mean, that's maybe... yeah um, it's, it's a bit like what we were talking about often in the way of trying to tell that story it is a whole load of preconceived notions about how you tell the story mm. you know often uh, I find myself saying to groups, uh, look, there's more to life than um, realism, for example, which is a, you know, a dominant commercial form and in which a lot of people then try to express what they're trying to uh, 
deal within themselves and they try to push it in to this form, mm. right? Without asking what that form is, without objectifying the form. You know, what, what, you know, what is realism? Where did that come from? Why is that, why is that the dominant mode? You know, what, you know, for me, the big question with that is, is the question of um, narration. Who, mm. who is narrator, mm. you know? Like, you, you can find some people who, they think they have a, a big story to tell and they're going straight into the first person. Um, and then, as they go into the first person, they realise that their first person is completely artificial. You know, they realise it's still made of language. Mm -hmm. You know, they cannot get, get, get out of language. You know, Derrida said, you know, language is always already writing. You are, you wake up and you wake up into writing. Language is being done upon you. You are born into it and you can't, you can't get, get out of it. So the, the, the act of I am going to speak in the first person is is not it's not an easy thing, and so you know, you might find that someone who began the first person may actually get more perspective on what they're doing in in a third person, for example, even though they thought they were writing some type of witness statement uh, 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 account. It's it's one thing to try and tell people or to try and help people get the story out of them, um, but. Often when they start trying to approach that, they realize that the story they thought they were wanted to tell is, was not it at all. But that's was a cover story. Yeah, yeah. You know? It's like the idea that the narrator was, I think as well, time, the idea of time, taking your time to find something that um, it mightn't reveal itself all at once, that it might take years for the for the form to present itself, the form that will actually help you crack it open. Yeah. It might be somebody completely different telling the story. Yes. Um, to, give, <laughs> to give it to somebody else, it, it can, can be, can be very, very liberating. And when is the story, when is the story being told? I'm often, I'm, I'm finding that's a more useful question for me as a writer. When is the story being told and where is it being told? And what happened at midnight, the night before the, sto the story started being told? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, there's I, I, even helping people tell their stories. That there's so many words in, in that that phrase that yeah, that you start to w w worry about. You know, help, story, <laughs> tell, and you go, oh, uh, what what is it that that we are doing here? You know, and that that question will come up again and again in in, in, in a course. What what are we doing here what what is this writing what is it that who is it in you that is looking to say something what, what who are they really you know like yeah i i like you try and start with go because you've got 10 people sitting around you who want, who, who want to write something and you have to assume that the reason they want to write something is that somebody is preventing them from writing something Mm. But why else would you want like there has to be an obstacle mm. so somebody has broken your tongue or something has broken your tongue at some part some point in your life maybe mm. repeatedly mm. and there's been this gradual build up you know that the silence and it is just getting bigger and bigger and it wants to come out you know and a lot of people that go right, I'm going to write, I'm going to write, write a short story, and the first thing that they do is go to some, you know, form of literary realism. You know, there's a character, they meet another character, they talk to each other, and you know, it's all the world is all empirically valid, and there it is, and you you know where everyone is, and everyone thinks in a predictable way. And you go, well, hold on a minute, like, is that really where you'll you need to go. Mm. It might be, but it might not be mm. the form, mm. the genre, mm. the technique, the approach mm. that you you are looking for. Mm. You're just grabbing mm. the first thing. Mm. Mm. Be like every painter 
mm. using the same paintbrush. Mm. You know, it's just. Yeah, because it's like people have an artistic thumbprint and that thumbprint can be very different. Uh, I had a theory for a while that the artistic thumbprint is, is often closer to the shadow self of the so the, the the writer the person who wishes to make the work presents themselves a certain way and that way is then it is what's helped them survive as a as a social animal yeah. up to this point yeah, yeah, yeah. and and then their but their their creative thumbprint the thumbprint that that is all through the work that they make can be radically different it can be everything that people would have thought that person was not that that person thought they were not and it can be a safe way to really to allow the shadow to come out and play yeah and then i mean perhaps an integration happens as the artist becomes older that the shadow and the the socially constructed self that the, the socially constructed self can bits of falseness can fall away and then the shadow actually gets to be more three-dimensional let's uh, let's hope so yes uh, as people who are getting rapidly <laughs> older let, let, let's hope that that, that yeah. is our destiny yeah, you yeah. know but did one wee thing on, on that um one thing that keeps turning up these days way back when, way back when we started that the thing you used to often hear when you're trying to push people is no i couldn't write that what would my ma say what would the wife say what would the husband say? Mm. i could oh god no, what you hear more is, oh no, I couldn't write that. What will social media say? Yeah. And that, it, yes. it, that, that it, social media has crept into the shadow. It's become the new superego. Well, it's, it's gone in there. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, people are paralyzed. Yeah. But I, 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 is that, can I do, uh, what, what will, yeah. can I, oh, I couldn't. Yeah. And it's no longer. The traditional authority figures, you know, your ma, your dad, your, you know, your partner, you know, your dog, whatever it is. No, it is a vague, vague mob violence that might come at you. Mm. And you don't even know what, what mm. you've done. So you just mm. end up afraid mm. and afraid to take a risk mm. in how one character mm. describes another character mm. is now fraught. Mm. You know, mm. man sees a woman. Mm. Woman sees a man. Mm. What do they see? Mm. What What do you mean? They fancy each other. What What, mm. what, what do you mean? Oh, mm. Describe that. Mm. It all starts to become mm. terrifying. Mm. You know, mm. who is objectifying who? Mm. All, all, all the, so, fear is come. It comes in the authority. The 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 new um, authority comes in through. Uh, unexpected ways you know mm. so the, like every, everyone has got a sensor someone of saying no to them mm. what, what they can or, or can't do what what is the biography mm. of that sensor mm. where where did it go where did it go back to mm. you know because it was born mm. it did come into being yeah and there's a really interesting argument here around which i suppose that big letter that you know people were signing yeah. saying everybody should be able to say something without mm. blah blah um but but there is a question around checking your privilege which is ah. like is a pretty brilliant thing to have is. to do and and it's like oh oh yeah yeah i it's uncomfortable to check but it's important to check privilege but yeah, it's yeah. also like to to what extent you know okay so how can this be genuinely risky for me so how can this be genuinely risky what, what where can i where am i being sincere in this and can i basically can i stand with my hands up and go okay i take it and maybe perhaps that's the thing to be able to um somebody was talking about billy bragg had a fantastic piece over the weekend and he was talking about the idea of he was looking at cancel culture in what to me was a very nuanced way but he's talking about the difficulty if you have a freedom of expression without accountability which is essentially if then it becomes impunity so then you say what you want to say with impunity and there's no but so there's a need for accountability but arguably the individual needs to hold themselves to account this does not mean um i suppose trying to pretend the shadow doesn't exist yeah 
which is the the sort of the whole Victorian conundrum that Freud was up against. If you sit on the shadow too long, it'll emerge as fascism. Mm. It'll emerge as Hitler. Mm. So how do you how do you engage with the shadow in a way that is ultimately creative and that yeah. is courageous? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, all, all, I'm, all I'm trying to say, like, if, if, to, everything you do on the page is political. Yeah. So, so there's no, there's no way out of that. Yeah. Right. So you just get, you dive into that, you know, yeah. and you're, you, if you're exploring character, you're going to hit problems. Yeah. Right. But the worst thing you can do is feel that you can't follow that character because it. Then, well, first, if you feel you can't character, you've chosen the wrong character, mm. right? Mm. But once you know your character, then you know you you have to run with that, and it may take you, and it may demand you to um, do things, say things, yeah, and allow things out that you didn't you didn't ever expect, yeah. You know, you are not in control, mm. particularly in the early stages of it getting the drafts done to get to give up as much of your so-called rational fair-minded compassion but you can also always test it you can always test the character so if you're say for example somebody's worried about offending well take out the character and have it tested and see what's what's authentic you know it's possible to do that but as did, well but, but I mean, dramatize the yeah, conflict yeah. in there so if you yeah. someone's being offensive then just yeah. bring on somebody yeah. to, to take it off yeah you know just yeah create, create make, make your problem their problem but yeah exactly <laughs> give, give it yeah give it something to run up against yeah. yeah but also there are plenty of like research is a great way of actually being being challenged and being forced to think around these things as well like there's always ways to be to, to have the intention tested to see where the truth of it is yeah but uh, i mean if you're shutting yourself down yeah at the it, early yeah. stages of, of making work yeah um that work is not yeah going nothing to will ever get made yeah yeah so yeah. sometimes just to let it go and you clear it yeah. all up later yeah you know yeah. and you can check yourself later but yeah. try to just get stuff yeah down Finish the fucking thing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and on that note, um, at this point, I'd give Sean a hug, but we're socially distanced, so that won't happen. I'd like to thank um, Declan for moderating the questions, Peter McNamara again for the brilliant gatekeeping, Peter Salisbury for um, s uh, sorting us out so gracefully with our, all our various technical hitches, a skip time failure in the matrix. And most of all, I'd really like to thank Sean for his characteristic honesty and presence and excitement and it was just a brilliant conversation and here's to loads more insights happening for all of you during the week and i'll see the fiction group on thursday thanks very much cheers <laughs> <laughs>